it's most appropriate to a poor country like Cambodia. So Moni Chender took me out into the countryside to meet 200 IDP families whose daughters, as a result of their poverty, are in danger of being lured into Phnom Penh and who find themselves being forced to go into a brothel. There's no social security in Cambodia. There's no safety net for peasants that have no land. And these people would starve if it were not for the rice that Moni Chenda gives them each day. The reasons why there are so many landless peasants in Cambodia are complex. They have to do with the Khmer Rouge, to do with the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. But more recently, it has to do with the fact that the Cambodian government is selling off vast tracts of the country to overseas investors, to foreign organisations that are um, setting up palm oil and other plantations, and of course logging concessions that have been given to overseas companies. 35% of Cambodia has been given to foreigners in the form of logging concessions. The logging is controlled by the military in Cambodia and the concessions are being given to countries which were only yesterday third world themselves, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, another activity that uh, Mostly the IDP people would uh, try to survive. It's being the labor of uh, some businessmen on the mat weaving, and this kind of product they would uh, uh, export to sell in Thailand uh, through Phoi Phat. including uh, to clean, to clean this kind of material. Uh -huh. Uh, so she had to pay another 2,000 real uh, for another man to clean that. So she got around 6,000 real for one mat. For one week? 6,000 real for one week? It's two dollars for one week's work? Uh, two dollars for one week's work. And how, how, many, how many people are there in this family? Three kids. How old are the kids? Oh. In 1995, some time even had no right to eat. Last year seemed to be a very critical time because uh, flat and the rice is very expensive. She had to advance the money from the, uh, the businessman in advance to buy rice, to buy uh, material, or to give, uh, to take care of the children. And when she got the 8,000 real, she pay what uh, farm and keep farm, and then. Uh, next time we pay farm and get farm and borrow again. So kind of uh, involving debt. Now I she, Re revolving she, revolving debt. Yeah, revolving debt. Now she owe to the businessman around uh, thirty thousand real or around uh, thirteen dollar something like that. Thirteen dollars. Yeah. This such a kind of amount of money is so small, but uh, she need to live for every day. But that amount of me is just a revolving debt. Maybe I can give her ten dollars. <laughs> It's a very small amount of money for money, me. But, uh, she, Ten dollars is a very small amount of money for yeah, me. Yeah, but this kind of money you make people to live uh, for how long? For ten days or more than ten days. Can these people buy land? Is there land for them to buy if there was money available for them to buy it? If you want to buy a land that also can make uh, some orchard around uh, uh, 100 meter to uh, 20 or 30 meter, you have to find 400 dollars for that. So how does it make you feel, Mani Chenda, when you see these children that are <laughs> six and seven years old and the only thing that's preventing them from having a proper, um, proper food and proper education is maybe $400 to support the family, to buy some land. Well, actually, uh, this is uh, become a chronic problem now. They're really difficult to solve. Uh, the thing is that these people, they have no chance. The problem of money to get $400 for each family, uh, if you try to do, I think that no NGO that could, uh, will be enough to do with 100 family or 200 family. I couldn't believe that $400 was all that was required to buy land that would make this little girl's family self-sufficient. That $400 was all that was required to buy a block of land that would make it unnecessary for Shanti to be begging on the street.
as I made my way back into Phnom Penh, the figure $400 stuck in my mind. The realization that $400 was all that was required to prevent a family of peasants from starving. Now there are 200 NGOs in Cambodia, non-government organizations, more NGOs in Cambodia than in any other country in the world. And I wondered why it was that one of these NGOs or a group of these NGOs couldn't buy land for these people. Given that the NGOs, the United Nations and the international community provide 50% of the royal government of Cambodia's budget, what were the NGOs spending their money on? How much of it winds up helping the people that it is designed to help? And how much of it goes into buying four-wheel drive vehicles, into renting villas and expensive houses, and into providing the NGOs with a Miami lifestyle in one of the poorest countries in the world? It may be that the NGOs, the United Nations, and the international community find it inappropriate to exert pressure on the Cambodian government not to sell vast tracts of land to foreigners, but surely, seeing that the land is for sale, the NGOs could buy some of the land and either give it to the landless peasants or sell it to them at a subsidised rate. It occurred to me that if each of the 200 NGOs in Cambodia were to sell, to sacrifice, one of their $40,000 four-wheel drive vehicles, it would be possible to buy land for 20,000 families, make them self-sufficient and therefore no longer in need of the aid that the NGOs are in Cambodia to provide. But then the question arises, which commercial enterprise in Cambodia could afford to buy $40,000 four-wheel drive vehicles? In search of answers to these questions, I approached the United Nations. Now, there are many UN agencies in Cambodia, but whilst the UN makes a big song and dance about the Declaration of Human Rights, one of which is freedom of speech, its employees are not allowed to speak to the media. Two years ago, the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation tapped one of its very own, Ron Hadlowski, for a special mission to organize a program to provide artificial limbs for another group of veterans, the victims of Cambodia's brutal civil war. Eventually I did find one NGO, or rather one former NGO, who had a lot of experience in Cambodia and who was in fact married to a Cambodian woman who was prepared to talk to me about his experiences in Cambodia as the head of a non-government organisation. ...have been given another chance. These landmines do not distinguish between babies and soldiers. They don't know the difference and they don't give a damn. Cambodia will be demined, but it will be demined one leg, one arm, and one life at a time. When I left my job, I was clearing more than $4,000 a month. I'm never going to make that kind of money back in America, I'll tell you that. And I didn't make that kind of money back in America. Um, but that not only that, no, let me, let me continue this a minute, because not only was I making $4,000 a month, clearing $4,000, more than $4,000, I had no overhead. I had absolutely no overhead to pay. Um, I, everything was paid for on my living allowance. And there are NGOs making $60,000 a year. It doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you pocket $60,000 a year and you're living in a country where the average yearly income is, what, $200, $300? Um, that separation of wealth is, to me, the number one uh, position that ought to be be looked at and discussed and put on the table. If Americans knew, and I think Australians knew, exactly how their dollar got broken down, exactly how much of it got to these sick, hungry, starving children, 